Last week, the UK's Committee on Climate Change launched its detailed roadmap for how the UK should get to net zero carbon by 2050. It was the most ambitious yet, arguing that it's now feasible to have 68% reduction of emissions by 2030. Was it practical and pragmatic? And should we just get on with it? Or was it problematic overreach and we should be alarmed? Would it get the job done? Would the population put up with it? All good questions. Let's have a look. For the purposes of this discussion, let's just accept the fact that the UK, along with the EU and a number of other countries, have decided that they're shifting their energy from fossil fuels to non-carbon based ones. Even if you think climate change isn't a thing, and there are some people who come to this channel who think like that, there are benefits in terms of air pollution from doing it. And in any case, we have an interest in seeing that if it's something that's going to be done, it should at least be done in a way that works. And by works, I mean it should support our prosperity and our freedom as a society, as well as obviously being successful in reducing emissions. Obviously, there will be some significant investment, as there always is, to be fair, in renewing key infrastructure. But it should be practical, effective, value for money. It should work. Not choices governed by ideology that end up with power cuts because somebody decided they didn't like something even though it was essential. Well, that's the premise of this video anyway. Take it or leave it. So, what is this carbon budget? Well, it arises from the Climate Change Act 2008, which required, amongst other things, the production of carbon budgets. So far, five carbon budgets have been put into law. We're currently living through the period of the third carbon budget, which the country is expected to successfully meet. That said, it's held to be currently off track for the next two budgets to come. These things are set well in advance because of the long-term nature of the decisions that feed into them. Along with this sixth carbon budget comes a description by the committee of the pathway to net zero, or more accurately in this case, the pathways to net zero, recognising that there are a number of variables in how far and how far certain things might happen, so it's produced a number of potential scenarios. In its previous report, which I supported and spoke well of in videos on this channel, it had just one further ambition scenario, which talked about how we could get to net zero. And that was very much at the radical end of that report. The committee now describes that further ambition scenario as, quote, relatively conservative. In total, it modelled 70 scenarios and used different combinations of those to come up with what it describes as five core exploratory scenarios. One is the headwind scenario, which is where the obstacles to progress are the most pronounced. One is the widespread engagement scenario, when behaviour change amongst the population goes further and faster than expected. One is the widespread innovation scenario, when a lot of the technological improvements come off faster and more effectively than we would currently expect. I mean, you know, we've seen three vaccines produced in nine months, so we should never underestimate our problem solving potential. One is the tailwind scenario where everything goes so much better than expected and we get to net zero by 2043. The committee admits that one is highly unlikely, but presumably they wanted to see if everything went as well as possible, what would be the earliest you could conceivably reach the target. Of course, you still have diehard environmental campaigners demanding zero by 2025 without feeling the need to explain how that beautiful unicorns farting rainbow scenario could come to pass. And then finally, you have their favoured balanced net zero pathway which is a blend of the other four. It's ambitious, it's very challenging, it's also, we think, entirely feasible, and crucially, I think, very, very appealing. Well, if it's very, very appealing, then that should be an easy sell, then. A few quick headlines. It sees emission cuts of around 21 megatons per CO2 equivalent from 2019 to 2035. It changes how those emissions should be counted in the future, incorporating for the first time the UK share of international aviation and shipping emissions. It recommends a completely decarbonised power sector by 2035, 
and an end to the sale of gas boilers for homes by 2033. Now, the key differences between the favoured scenario this year and the previous further ambition scenario from last year is that it sees lower use of fossil fuels sooner and lower emissions from hard to decarbonise sectors such as aviation and heavy industry. Those lower emissions come from more optimistic assumptions about the rollout of technology. There's less carbon capture and storage and more use of natural emissions removal methods such as tree planting. But one of the things I found most interesting and difficult to be honest is this. Behavioural changes play a bigger role in the favoured scenario, including a 35% reduction in meat consumption by 2050 compared to 20% in the previous one. Now this is challenging for me. One of the reasons why I liked the previous version was that it minimised demands on people to change their lifestyle, to have the government tell them what they could or couldn't eat, where they could or couldn't go. But this version is making a proposition. Most of the emissions cuts we've seen to date have largely been invisible to the population. Energy supply sources change behind the scenes. That sort of thing. Now, it was always going to become more visible. The committee estimates that 43% of emission cuts will involve changes in the technology for things that people use. Most prominently, the switch to electric vehicles from petrol and diesel and the shift of home heating from gas and heating oil to electric heat pumps. Now, that's all good. At the end of the day, so long as the replacements work more or less the same as what they're replacing, that's kind of what we expected. But the committee also now see the 16% of the emissions reductions to come from societal or behavioural changes, specifically flying and eating meat. Well, OK, we'll come back to that. Because it, it may be a small percentage, it's the area of the media and the environmentalists most obsess about and there's an important point of substance underpinning it. Now, the committee looked across all its scenarios and tried to work out if it was possible to meet the net zero target without any element whatsoever of carbon capture and storage. Some people find that controversial. The answer came back, no, you're not going to do any of this without some element of carbon capture and storage. OK. When it comes to the cost, the news is that the six carbon budget estimates lower prices than had previously been floated. With its original advice last year, it was estimated that between 1% to 2% of GDP would need to be invested each year to reach the target. That led the then Chancellor Philip Hammond, who wasn't a huge fan, if I recall correctly, to put a figure of more than £1 trillion on the price. Is that all, I hear you say? Cheap at half a price, surely? In this report, the cost estimates are significantly lower. This is largely because of falling prices. So, for instance, in the latest auction round, the price of offshore wind capacity has fallen by a third compared to the previous one two years ago. It also reflects the fact that the committee was deliberately conservative in its assumptions. So they now anticipate that achieving net zero would involve 0.6% of GDP by the early 2030s, falling to 0.5% by 2050. Now, as always, small sounding percentages still add up to large amounts. Let's not be fooled into thinking any of this is small change. Last year, GDP was £2.17 trillion. So 0.5% of that is nearly £11 billion per year. That said, the report points out that it doesn't necessarily mean that costs expressed as fractions of GDP will necessarily reduce GDP by an equivalent amount. If money that would have been spent importing fossil fuels gets redirected to UK investment in local energy sources, then GDP could actually increase as a result. Cambridge Econometrics, who did the costings, said that the narrative has been in the past around cost, but it should be focused instead on investment. Achieving the carbon budget would result in an increase in GDP of around 2% by 2030 and 3% by 2050, with a boost to employment of around 1% over the next decade. Which is true, although, as the report also admits, you have to factor in the fact that you're also losing a number of jobs from high carbon sectors. So you can't assume it's a straightforward equation on either side. Now, I like the fact that the committee tends towards conservative estimates and tries to avoid overclaiming, unlike some of the political leaderships of our time. But you still have to treat promises to boost GDP with caution. It's still a promise of jam tomorrow, and we should at least be prepared for events not to play out quite so conveniently. 2020 has taught us that, if nothing else. 
Now, the report goes into detail about all the different sectors that will need to be transformed to be decarbonised. So a look at some of the key ones. Surface transport is one of the biggest current areas of emissions. And it's also the one where changes might lead to improvements in people's health as you remove pollutants from the air that people breathe. In this case, the government has already committed to a 2030 deadline for the sale of fossil fuel cars with £1.3 billion earmarked for a charging infrastructure, which the committee agrees is about the right level of investment. It also welcomes the government's plan to develop gigafactories in the UK to scale up the production of batteries for electric vehicles. Heavy goods vehicles produce 17% of emissions. The Commission says that you should require an end to diesel HGVs by 2040. And the government has to decide whether it most favours hydrogen or electricity as the principal power for such vehicles. Buildings is one of the tricky sectors, since changing the entire stock of housing and commercial buildings is obviously huge. The committee says that building emissions need to fall by roughly 50% by 2035. It says that new buildings should be required to be built to net zero standards within five years. That would see 2.2 million heat pumps in new build homes by 2030. It says that another 3.3 million would be installed to existing homes by the same deadline. If you think that sounds easy, say you're an Extinction Rebellion campaigner, for instance, and you assume that such things can just happen? Consider this. Right now there's approximately 26,000 heat pumps installed per year. To move from 26,000 to 500,000 per year and then to a million ultimately means the industry needs to be seriously scaled up. Vast numbers of people being trained in the necessary skills. At the same time, bear in mind, many existing jobs based around servicing and installing gas boilers are going to be shifting. I mean, this is massive change. Manufacturing and construction is another of the most challenging sectors to fully decarbonise. The committee says that policies need to be designed carefully, not to simply make manufacturers uncompetitive and to drive manufacturing overseas. And this, of course, is absolutely right. I always talk on here about bad policies creating perverse incentives. If you focus on carbon reduction to the exclusion of all else, you just end up displacing it, not reducing it. If manufacturing jobs move to elsewhere, the UK's carbon goes down, but only because the same work is now being done somewhere else, to the impoverishment of your own workforce. As a result, the committee suggested that in the short term, there would need to be subsidies for transition for a number of sectors, getting them to move to electrification or hydrogen for those sectors that can't be electrified, like steel and cement. It says this would be two to three billion per year in the early 2030s, after which taxpayer support could begin to fall. The report has a whole section on electricity generation. And on the very day I'm shooting this video, the government has released its long awaited energy white paper. It seems at first glance to be broadly in line with what the committee has suggested here, which is not a huge surprise. I'll flag any deviations or highlights in the end of a week video when I've had a chance to give it a proper look. A lot of the headlines already known. Significant increase in offshore wind power, investment in hydrogen infrastructure, support for innovation in carbon capture, some solid commitment for a certain amount of nuclear. Then we get to agriculture and land use. Key difficult area. The UK's combined agriculture and land emissions were 67 megatons per CO2 equivalent in 2018, which the favoured scenario sees us falling to 40 by 2035. The committee suggests auction contracts, similar to those offered for renewable energy, for afforestation and some agroforestry schemes. These would focus on areas of public goods for which there's no real business utility. So, for instance, for restoration of upland peat, for rewetting and sustainable management of lowland peat. Then there are some assumptions that I find questionable. Around 9% of agricultural land will be needed for actions to reduce emissions and sequester carbon by 2035, with 21% needed by 2050. So some agricultural land is going to be taken out of use for growing food. This, it says, can be partly offset by improvements in efficiency, which is fine, I accept that, but not all of it. Are we sure we want to be growing less food in the brave new Brexit Britain? And at the time of making this video, we still don't know whether we've got a trade deal on that or not, although it's changing minute by minute. 
But is there really a strong case for reducing locally grown produce? Now, some of that's for forests, and I can see the value of that, although I imagine it doesn't have to be only agricultural land, which makes way for that. Some of it is for biofuel production, and that seems highly suspect. Biofuels are the least efficient use of land for energy that you can get, and I'm not convinced. But then we get to the most contentious part. There should be policies to encourage the move away from meat and dairy with a 20% shift away by 2030, so in just 10 years, and a further 15% reduction of meat products by 2050. The remarkable thing about this is that the National Farmers Union embraced a net zero by 2040 target for agriculture. It promised it would make the industry zero carbon, net zero carbon, without any such transition required. They released an initial response to this report, clearly with a fair degree of frustration and despair, for their plans have been waved aside here to institute a meat is bad principle. For me, a good Conservative principle, and this is a Conservative government, remember, is that you should encourage people to take responsibility for their own area if they can do it. They will come up with better solutions because it's in their interest to do so. Of course, you have to have external accountability and all of that. But if the industry has said we can decarbonise, why wouldn't you say, great, let's work on it together? Is it because with this meat question, there's some ideology intruding on the pragmatism? There's a lot of confusion, for instance, about how you should measure the emissions from livestock, particularly when it comes to methane. Environmentalists who are anti-meat tend to describe how much more of a powerful greenhouse gas methane is and add it to the equation as the impact of the industry. But methane is relatively short-lived in the atmosphere. It degrades. And that means that if the number of livestock remains stable, not growing, then the quantity of methane contributed by them to the atmosphere remains stable. Unlike CO2, it doesn't continue to build up. Taking that into account can make a significant difference in your equations of what contributes what to the problem. Add to that, breeding and the type of feed given means that British meat produces less methane than the world average by far. You have a number of factors in there that you should be considering. But it seems as though the calculations have not been about what are the different scenarios about how you would decarbonise agriculture but rather what percentage of meat reduction can we get? All the scenarios presume that that's the answer. It's just down to how much the public will put up with. Nothing has dented my previous support for this exercise more than that one fact. Because now I'm revisiting my impression that this was being done on a very practical and pragmatic basis. If you look at the actual policy proposals for this area that the committee puts forward, there's little more than weasel words. Government should implement low-cost, low-regret actions to encourage a shift away from meat and dairy. An evidence-based strategy is required to establish which measures will successfully change behaviour, encompassing information provision, skill support and encouraging greater accountability of business through clear and robust metrics and mandatory reporting. Advocacy, I get. It won't change much and they know it. Skill support is a bit weird. If you can cook meat, you can cook vegetables. Accountability of business is interesting. It suggests that pressure will be put on business to reduce meat content of meals, which would probably be feasible. Most meat-based ready meals, for instance, could probably swap out 20% of the meat content in a way people wouldn't much even notice or care about. But that's not about behaviour change. That's what you would describe as choice editing, removing certain options from being choices. It then adds this. If these measures are not enough to change consumption patterns, a second stage will need to look at stronger options, whether regulatory or pricing. So if you don't voluntarily change, we'll push a bit harder and a bit harder. Totally unnecessary. Work with the farming industry to support them to reduce the impact of the food they produce and let people eat what they want. This project is only going to work if people see that it's evidence-based and trying hard to enable people to have what they want just without the negative impact. 
People might then even accept the message, ultimately, that certain changes are necessary in the final analysis, but only if they've seen you fighting for them to have what they want up until the end. If they think that instead you're cramming down on them with an ideological agenda, you will lose support as readily as Brexit, and you can't decarbonise a country with 48% support. From what I've seen, it's the meat aspect that's attracted a lot of attention and most of the negative pushback on Twitter. Twitter is not real life, but I would still take that as a key indicator that this is the area where you will least get away with sloppy thinking. As it is, I now have to amend my former assessment on the Committee for Climate Change work. I still broadly believe it has done the most work in detail on the process of decarbonising an industrial nation in the most desirably pro-capitalist way. However, it does not fully respect freedom in how it does so, and some of its work does not appear to be focused on emissions reductions as much as it does an ideological position. That only applies to a minority of the report, but an extremely important minority. Fortunately, it's advice and not policy. The NFU and others still continue to talk to the actual government and to inform what it chooses to do. I'm hoping that government will not take an agenda to start dictating to people about what they're allowed to eat and what they're allowed to do. If they do, they deserve to lose support. Micromanaging what people are allowed to do through a pandemic is one thing, and the majority of the population have supported it. Doesn't mean that we think government should get into the bad habit of defaulting to the view that it's its business to manipulate us and ultimately order us to do what it thinks best. That's my initial response anyway. No doubt there will be lots of views. Let me know yours in the comments section below.